Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hello, hello, veggie lovers, and thank you for coming back to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today, I have a really very special episode for you. This woman is a powerhouse, Dr. Robin Chutkan. She's amazing. I've actually been trying to get her on my podcast for a while, so I'm so happy that we were finally able to connect and talk about her latest book. But before I tell you more about her, just a reminder that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about you or your child's eating, nutrition, or growth, please consult a doctor. Okay, so hopefully you've already heard about Dr. Chutkan, but Dr. Robin Chutkan is an integrative gastroenterologist and the author of four digestive wellness books, Gut Bliss, The Microbiome Solution, The Bloat Cure, and The Antiviral Gut. Educated at Yale and Columbia, she's a faculty member at Georgetown Hospital and the founder of the Digestive Center for Wellness in Washington, D.C., a a former governing board member and training committee chair of the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. She's authored dozens of scientific articles and lectured globally on the role of the microbiome in health and disease. She's a frequent medical expert on the Dr. Oz Show, the Today Show, CBS This Morning, and other media outlets. Dr. Chutkan is passionate about democratizing access to gut health information and introducing more dirt, sweat, and vegetables into her patients' lives. She is incredible, and her new book, new book is about viruses and how we can strengthen our microbiome and our bodies so that we can become more resilient to fighting off viruses. And even for those of us that may have ended up with long COVID symptoms or other post-viral symptoms, what can you do? How can you become empowered to get better and to recover from these illnesses? So in this episode, we talk about her journey into gastroenterology and how she came into this more holistic approach with integrating food and other lifestyle habits and behaviors into her practice. We talk about the virome, why it's important, what we can do to support our gut microbiome in order to strengthen our immune system, and is it possible to become more resilient to viral infections. We talk about how we can support our gut health to improve post-viral symptoms, the role of stress on the gut microbiome. We talk about non-nutritive sweeteners or artificial sweeteners, including monk fruit and stevia and her opinion on those. We talk about alcohol and how it affects the gut microbiome and how you can determine what the right amount for you might be. We also talk about her morning routine and what she wishes more people knew, which I think is fantastic. So you are going to love this episode. This episode is especially important for those people that might struggle with gut symptoms, even things like inflammatory bowel disease. She has some really great information. And also this is very applicable for parents. We talk about pediatrics, we talk about children and her experience with her own child, which is what brought her to the work that she does today. So veggie lovers, thank you so much for being here again. If you're new, welcome. I hope that you love this podcast and this episode and that you will share it with people that you think would benefit from it. So thank you so much. And let's welcome Dr. Robin Chutkin. Dr. Robin Chutkin, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here with you. 
Well, I'm a big fan of your work. I followed you for many years and got to meet you in person at one of the conferences. Now I can't remember which one it was. So I'm so glad that- I think that... it was Plantstock. Maybe it was Plantstock. No, I haven't, been, I haven't been to that one, but it was probably Plantrician or something like that. But oh, yeah. That's a great I'm one. glad that we finally were able to connect and talk together. And you have a new book, but before we- I start think. talking about the book and just the fascinating topic of talking about the virome, virome and viruses. Take us back to how did you end up in gastroenterology and how did you end up focusing on the work that you do, gastroenterology that's more focused on lifestyle medicine? Yeah, in medical school, I was at Columbia for medical school and I thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon because wow. my dad's an orthopedic surgeon, my brother's an orthopedic surgeon. It was seemed like the family business, but unfortunately within about five or six minutes of my first day in my orthopedic surgery rotation, I realized, yeah, this is not for me. Fascinating field, but you know, lots of hammering and drilling. And um, <laughs> so like a lot of us in medicine, I think it was a process of elimination. I knew I couldn't do ophthalmology because I could never see the retina with the ophthalmoscope. And I liked OBGYN, but it was a little unpredictable with babies popping out and so I went through a process of elimination. I like general surgery, but that field was a little hierarchical. It was a lot of kind of yes, sir, no, sir, moving down the chain of command. Gastroenterology was appealing because it involves men, women, young, old, you know, everybody has a digestive tract and unfortunately, eventually something usually goes wrong with it. So it felt like it was more, more sort of applicable to a larger population. Although in my practice, I have seen, I would say my practice is about 70 to 80% women, mm -hmm. which is not surprising because a really unusual fact in GI is that about 70 to 80% of the patients are women. But when I was a GI fellow, it was less than 10%. We were single digits for women. Now I'm happy to say we're into the double digits and it's a great time to be a woman in gastroenterology. But at the time it was a, it was a little less common. And I, I remember people in medical school saying to me, why do you want to wade through stool and like GI is kind of like an icky field. And of course the gut is having an amazing moment. Now people realize that it is really the engine for your entire body, right? What goes on in the gut informs what goes on in your brain and your immune system and your joints. So that's been a really wonderful discovery. So I was a quite conventionally trained gastroenterologist. I did my training at Columbia and then at Mount Sinai. And then I joined the faculty at Georgetown Hospital here in Washington in 1997. And my area of expertise, if you will, is inflammatory bowel disease. So autoimmune GI diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But I started noticing that a lot of my patients were using other things beyond what I was prescribing to treat their GI conditions. And I got really interested in food as medicine. And then I had an, my own sort of awakening when my daughter, who's now 17 and a half, right around the circumstances of her birth, I w had a healthy pregnancy and she was a healthy baby at birth, but she was a C-section baby. I had the flu. They ended up giving both her and I antibiotics, a lot of them for her at birth. And you know what happens with babies born via C-section versus vaginally. They miss out on that important colonization as they're coming through the mother's birth canal. And then she got whopping doses of IV antibiotics at birth. And then my breast milk dried up. So she missed out on all the important micro boosters in breast milk. And then she basically ended up getting antibiotics every month till she was about two. We had wonderful pediatricians, but I think they just didn't make the connection between all the antibiotics she had received at birth, a C-section, minimal nursing, and continued antibiotics. And by the time she was about two, she'd had two dozen courses of antibiotics, and she was a really sickly child, getting sick all the time. And that is really when I had my aha moment, if you will, and realized that although these physicians were incredibly well-meaning, they weren't necessarily well-informed in terms of that connection. And to be fair, you know, this is almost 20 years ago, none of us were really well informed about that connection between early use of antibiotics and not just illness at the time, but risk for autoimmune disease, for asthma, for obesity, for allergies, for all of these things. So I had to veer off that path. And I'm fortunate that as a physician, I was able to do that. You know, I was able to recognize when she was really sick, needed to see a doctor versus when she wasn't. And you know, some split pea soup and green juice could solve the problem. But over time she did regain her health. I'm 
happy to say, and she's a senior in high school, a rower, healthy, tall, strong. And um, I really, you know, that whole experience is really what got me started on this path towards connecting the dots between what's going on in our gut and the rest of our health. And I see it every day with my patients with autoimmune disease. So often they have a history like Sydney's of frequent antibiotic use in childhood. And so we see that clinically. And we also know scientifically from lots of studies, we have a big study in the GI literature published in the journal Gut in 2014 that shows that early antibiotic use is a major risk factor for autoimmune diseases like Crohn's. So that, uh, that's what got me here. And I'm, I, I wish I could have a redo for the circumstances around her birth, but at the same time, I'm really grateful because it did open my eyes and allowed me to make the connection and then to share that for you know patients in my practice through the books, et cetera. Wow, what an amazing story. It was really pediatrics that brought you around actually, right? <laughs> so it was. having that, you know, experiences with our children, especially because with our children, and especially when they're little, we're watching their every move and making connections to everything. So that experience was really what kind of brought that awareness of like, wow, there's there's something else going on here. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, I, I and I, I'm sure there are many people listening who have had the same experience. When she was sick, I would literally feel like I wish I could suck the sickness out of her and bring it into my body and I could be sick for her. You know, watching mm -hmm. your child or a loved one suffer and be in pain and be ill and not not really having a solution is really such something that's so difficult. But here's the thing, that is so often when concerned parents want to immediately reach for something, right? There must be a pill. There, you know, so this instinct to treat, to make people better. And, you know, I'm not a pediatrician, I'm an adult gastroenterologist, but I have a lot of these conversations with my patients. And, you know, sometimes we just have to be sick. Sometimes we have to suffer a little bit through it. And it's really about being a well-informed parent, consumer of health, et cetera, to understand you know, when can we just sort of let this ride versus when do we need to do something? And one of the common examples I like to use is fever. You know, we get very scared by fever. I remember, I mean, our daughter would spike a fever 104, she'd be screaming. And my husband who is not in medicine, he would look at me and I would be like, I don't know, you know, and you just want to do something. But when you think about the purpose of fever and the fact that it has survived throughout evolution, it primarily, as you know, has a protective role. So if we think about viruses and fever, we know that viruses like poliovirus replicate 250 times faster at normal body temperature versus when we have a fever. Mm -hmm. So when we take an antipyretic, whether that's you know acetaminophen, ibuprofen or something to bring our fever down, what we are also doing unknowingly is sabotaging one of our main antiviral defenses, right? So we're lowering our body temperature and instead of halting viral replication, which is what the fever was trying to do, now the virus is allowed to replicate unchecked. So, so it's important for people to understand, you know, when do you treat a fever? When is it okay to have a fever? When is a fever actually a good thing? And so really the work I do, the work you do, is really about creating more well-informed consumers so that we can all be great advocates for our own health and our family's health. Absolutely. Yes, I, I am a pediatrician. So I live this life day in and day out, panicked parents and fevers. And I explained the very same thing is that we don't need to fear fever, but we do need to pay attention to any other symptoms that would be concerning in a child. Pay attention more to how they're doing rather than that number, the temperature number. But going so back true. to the antibiotic yeah. point too, there has been a big shift and especially in my patient population because for my my office i tend to attract families that are more health conscious and they're concerned about overusing antibiotics so i feel i've been practicing for 13 years i feel like at the beginning i was doing more of the no you don't need antibiotics these are the reasons you don't need antibiotics and now it's more like actually i really do think we need this antibiotic so it's like one of those things which is good in that That's i think parents, very good to yeah they're starting to realize we need to be responsible with our antibiotic use and not just throw them out willy-nilly so it is it is good i feel like things 
things are slowly changing in that direction. Hopefully we'll find a balance because thank goodness we do have antibiotics for some things. We Absolutely. really do need them, but we don't need to be throwing them at these things that really the antibiotics not even going to be helping anyway. It's just maybe making us feel better on some level, but it can cause a lot of these problems in the future like you're talking about. So let's talk about the virome. What yeah. is the virome and why is it important? Yeah, you know, this pandemic has made armchair virologists out of out of a lot of us. So, you know, a few years ago, nobody knew what the virome was or really cared. I mean, we're just starting to understand the microbiome. And of course, viruses are a part of the microbiome, right? Microbiome, trillions of organisms that live in and on our bodies, mostly in our gut. And that includes bacteria, parasites, viruses, fungal organisms, etc. But we can drill down, as you just pointed out, a little bit more to the virome. And to put it in perspective for your audience in terms of numbers, we have about 10 to 100 times as many bacterial cells as human cells. And then we have about 10 times as many viruses in our body as we do have bacteria. So it's a lot. I mean, I think the latest number I read was 380 trillion, which is more than stars in the universe. So this is a ton. More than more than um, a million in a drop of seawater, and that's the important thing to understand too. Like we can't hide from viruses; they're everywhere. They're in the Sahara. They're in the oceans. They're everywhere in our environment. But just as most bacteria are not out to get us and are not harmful, and in fact are, live very symbiotically with us, this the same is true for viruses. And it was pretty shocking when I was researching this book. I mean, the the first three books, which are squarely digestive health books. I feel like I could have just sort of vomited them out, right? This is what I, it's GI analogy. That was a great pun. <laughs> this is what I, you know, live, breathe, eat, sleep every day for the last 30 years. Like this is my stuff. But of course, writing about viruses, I'm not a virologist, I'm not a microbiologist. And then in addition, the science is changing every day. So it was, you know, I felt like I was waking up and, you know, reading and, and researching and writing a 20 page research paper. But one of the things that is really fascinating is that there is a fair amount we do know already about viruses, including that in addition to being sort of everywhere in the environment, they are also part of us. Up to 10% of our own genome is made up of viral genetic material. And that's because when a virus, a virus to be alive has to infect a living animal, plant, a, a, a living in a, another cell that's alive and then it hijacks the cellular machinery and tricks it into making copies of itself and so when a virus gets into our bodies and it can infect a sperm cell or a gamete so it infects something that then becomes part of our reproductive material gets into our genetic code and that's why as much as 10 percent of our genetic code is viral material and some of it is for really important stuff like encoding memories or making placental proteins that are involved in reproduction. There's a quote in the chapter on the virome that I open with by Tony Goldberg, who's an epidemiologist, and it says, if all viruses suddenly disappeared, the world would be a, a great place for about a day and a half, and then we'd all die. <laughs> so kind of like our bacteria, right? We are actually dependent on these organisms. There's incredible symbiosis, and that's an important thing to understand too, because Early on with you know, the popularity of the microbiome, people didn't understand. Remember when they were selling antibacterial mattresses? You know, I remember it was like antibacterial everything, antibacterial clothing and spray and mattresses and bathtubs. And then people went, wait a second. Oh, you mean these bacteria aren't all bad and some of them may actually be good and, and helpful and good to keep around. And now it's all probiotic everything, right? So we're kind of seeing the same trajectory with viruses, like viruses are terrible and we need to, you know, antiviral everything. And then people are now starting to say, well, wait a second, maybe, maybe we need to take a different approach. And the approach that I'm a huge advocate for is this idea of the health of the host, right? The idea that with a healthy host, you are able to survive intact most viral threats, just you, like you are most bacterial threats. And it's not that outlandish an idea because, you know, if you think about something like heart disease, if you're an 85 year old and you're overweight and a smoker and sedentary and you have high blood pressure and diabetes and you have a heart attack, you're not gonna do as well as somebody who is healthy. 
and doesn't have any of those risk factors. Somebody who's maybe younger, not a smoker, maybe a runner, eats a healthy whole food plant-based diet, et cetera. So in every disease, whether it's heart disease, cancer, infectious disease, autoimmune disease, we see that a healthy host has a better outcome. And the same is true for viruses. So there are a number of different factors that you can look at, and we've seen a lot of them. We've seen factors like age, comorbid illness, having obesity, but it turns out that the most predictive factor for how you're gonna do after exposure to a virus is actually your microbiome. And those, that's from data from studies done in China and also in the US that shows that high levels of a bacteria called Fecalobacterium prosnitzii, affectionately known as F. prosnitzii, high levels, which are also associated with being plant eaters and eating a high fiber diet, predict a much better outcome and low levels are more predictive of needing a ventilator, being in the ICU and even death. And in that study, they found that that was 92% predictive of severe respiratory complications, which is actually more predictive than all the other factors we use like age, gender, comorbidity, even uh, you know inflammatory markers that we measure in the blood, more predictive than all of them combined. So. It really does speak to this idea that what's going on in your gut is paramount to your overall health as well as specifically to your outcome after viral illnesses. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's why fiber is my favorite F word because it's so important. <laughs> so, I mean, you kind of already started talking about this, but fiber being super important and eating more plants, but what are some other things that we can do to support our gut microbiome to strengthen our immune system? And you said that it's possible to become more resilient to getting viral infections, but what about recovering from one after you've already acquired a viral infection? Absolutely. So I like to break it down into this sort of three basic steps you can do to, I, I hate to use any sort of word like hack or anything, let's say to rehab to improve your microbiome. The first is to remove offending foods, practices, habits, et cetera, that are damaging your microbiome because otherwise you're filling a bathtub with a, with a stopper out, right? And you're not really accumulating anything in the bathtub. So you have to make sure that you're not doing things that are really deleterious to your microbiome as you're really trying to improve the robustness, the richness, the diversity. And key amongst those things would be looking in your medicine cabinet. So we know the startling statistic for antibiotics is that about five days, five days to a week of a broad spectrum antibiotic that most people would use to treat a sinus infection, a urinary tract infection, et cetera, can remove up to a third of your gut microbes. And this is not a matter of then just running off and taking a probiotic and saying, okay, now I'm even, right? We know it doesn't work like that. So making sure, you know, judicious use of antibiotics is high on that list. But it's not just antibiotics. So also what other drugs? Proton pump inhibitors, mm -hmm. acid blockers that are amongst the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world. And now I see a lot of kids on them, which is really worrisome because these drugs are very good at what they do. They completely shut off that proton pump in the stomach. And so the stomach acid drops, it drops dramatically. But what that also means is that you have now removed one of your main defenses against viruses, which is the acid that unravels and denatures a viral protein when it gets in through the stomach. And you've also set up an alkali condition, which is very hospitable for overgrowth of the wrong type of bacteria. So you've really dramatically changed the bacterial and viral ecosystem in your body by removing stomach acid, not to mention how you've disrupted digestion because now the enzymes don't work well at an alkali pH versus acidic. So just you know, a reminder for people that acid reflux is not because of overproduction of stomach acid, it's because of inappropriate opening of that valve, the sphincter, between the esophagus and the stomach that allows acid to come up where it shouldn't. And we know very well what are the factors that lead to that. So overfilling the stomach, eating late at night, high fat, high animal protein diet, all, we know all of those things and we know how we can prevent them in most people. So that's, uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind, the medicine cabinet. There's a whole long list in the book as well as questions you can ask your doctor if you're on one of these drugs, substitutes, how to make these drugs less toxic, you know, what doses, et cetera. So I give people a lot of practical information. 
but the medicine cabinet is an important place to look as part of the remove. And then of course there are certain foods, although I'll, I'll tell you Dr. Yami, I don't focus a lot on what people should eliminate. I focus on what they're missing, like the F word. So I'm less concerned about, you know, taking away your pizza. I'm more concerned about adding in like a little spinach salad or a carrot or two along with it. Because what we found, it's really what's missing that is primarily driving a lot of the damage. But along those lines, I tell people, you know, the, the, there've been a lot of press lately about the ultra processed foods. And it's and about the link between ultra processed foods and colon cancer. The recent article was in men, but of course we see the same, same is true in women also. And yes, these foods are less nutrient rich for sure, and they're less microbially rich, but they also have a lot of things added to them, as you know, emulsifiers and other things to prolong the shelf life and give them a certain consistency. And it turns out that a lot of these chemicals are harmful to gut bacteria and they're damaging to the gut lining. So that's true of artificial sweeteners, of highly processed foods. When you look at that list of ingredients and it starts to sound like a chemistry experiment, that's because it is, you know, it's, it's seized being food. It's now an edible food like substance. And I always think, you know, if I took somebody into a chemistry lab and I gave them a beaker with all these, you know, sodium carbonic acid and all these different things. And I, I said to them, okay, give me your 10 year old, tell them to open up. I'm going to pour this stuff down. They would be aghast, right? They would be like, you're not putting that stuff into my kid, but they, Yet we still do that all the time with some of these foods that have these ingredients. And I think part of that is the marketing is so aggressive and, you know, these folks are really clever. So there's all this stuff in it to give it the mouthfeel, the flavor, the taste, make you want more, but it's important to look at the ingredient list. So foods are another thing in terms of the remove, like we have to try and eliminate or cut down on those things that are damaging our essential fragile microbes. The next is the replace. And when I say replace, people often then, you know, they get out their notebook, they're like, okay, what probiotic? <laughs> and they're a little surprised to hear that I'm not recommending a probiotic. I'm really recommending more exposure to nature, to soil microbes. And that includes both yourself, getting your hands, your feet literally getting a little dirty, but also the food because if your food isn't grown in microbially rich soil, you're not getting that benefit. And so trying to get people out of the supermarket to the farmer's market or to sign up for a community supported agriculture box, something, but to eat more produce that is grown in dirt. When I see the carrots at the supermarket and you know, they're all exactly 4.7 inches uniform orange color, and then I go to the farmer's market and the carrots are so gnarly looking, you know, they've got like little fingers coming out of them and they're chubby and funny looking. And I'm like, this is great. This is, you know, how it's supposed to be. So I, I'm suspicious of this very good looking fruit and vegetables. So we have to really think when we're replacing about ourselves getting out into nature and the food and where it's coming from. And, you know, speaking of nature, there is this really fascinating thing called the outdoor air factor, the OAF, that is defined as a germicidal constituent in open air that is toxic to pathogenic bacteria and viruses. And so if we look back, for example, at the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, we see this startling statistic of people who recovered inside having in some instances as high a mortality as 40%, that's four zero because I I have a bit of an accent um, versus 13% for people who recovered outside. And so we know there's something in open air that not only decreases transmission, right? Transmission is less outside, but we know recovery is also better outside because of, you know, these factors in the air. So the replace is again, how can you replenish. And yes, there is a role for probiotics and prebiotic foods, etc. But it's also about, you know, how can we get this exposure in our environment? And then the third part is restore. How can we restore our microbiome and the health of our gut lining? And this really boils down to diet, right? How should we be eating to feed our gut microbes and to make sure we have that healthy gut lining? Because again, the gut lining itself is an important barrier. It's just one cell thick, 
but it is the, and the only thing that protects us from the outside environment that our gut is exposed to, you know, as a, as a long hollow tube. And so we know, for example, in that study, that high levels of a bacteria called Enterococcus faecalis, so kind of bad guy compared to Fecalobacterium prasnitzii, we know high levels of that bacteria can, are associated with that bacteria can penetrate the gut lining and get into the bloodstream and access the inner organs of the body and it can bring SARS-CoV-2 with it. Mm -hmm. So we know an intact gut lining and a healthy, a healthy microbiome are also really important tools in keeping us safe. And you, you know, the other part of the question you asked was about what about people who already have viruses? So even though long COVID is a new syndrome, post-viral syndromes are not new at all. AIDS is a post-viral syndrome. Hepatitis C, chronic hepatitis C and cirrhosis is a post-viral syndrome. Mono is a post-viral syndrome. Herpes is a post-viral syndrome, and so is shingles. So we know that a lot of viruses can cause symptoms long-term, they can flare up. And if we look at an exact, if we look at chronic fatigue syndrome, an ME-CFS, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, we know that there are very strong viral correlates with that herpes virus, human herpes virus six and others. We see Epstein-Barr virus for mono. And we know that those patients have a microbial signature. They have dysbiosis. They have abnormalities in their microbiome that are predictive. And in fact, researchers at Cornell could identify people with chronic fatigue syndrome just by looking at the microbiome, mm -hmm. right? And so we're seeing a lot of similarities with long COVID that people who have long COVID often have dysbiosis. To make it more confusing, the virus itself can induce dysbiosis when it binds to the ACE2 receptor. The ACE2 re receptor can upregulate and downregulate things and also cause some microbial disturbances. But we know that focusing in on that microbial imbalance in the gut is a really good place to start when we're thinking about long COVID. And of course, there are other factors we have to think about also, but we know that uh, for helping those patients really restore the health of their gut, there's a lot that can go a long way towards ameliorating some of the other symptoms that they're having. Mm -hmm. So basically the same strategies, but focusing in on, like you said, the rehab of your gut, trying to get to that place where your body is able to fight these symptoms. Exactly. And, you know, I, I try not to oversell the microbiome. As a gastroenterologist who works in this field, it's very exciting for me. And it is literally miraculous sometimes to see with my patients with complicated Crohn's and ulcerative colitis to see not just them looking better, but to look in their guts and see that their deep ulceration has healed. Their narrowed areas are now open. I mean, it is really... It is literally the best part of what I do and the thing that I just love doing. But we also, again, with those complex autoimmune diseases, we see similarities with long COVID and post-viral syndromes. We know that autoimmunity, that even though people with long COVID don't have an autoimmune disease per se, we see a lot of the same markers of autoimmunity and um, the sense that the body is reacting to itself, right? And the, the immune system is overactive. So some of the damage from long COVID we think is due to the virus itself, but some of it is due to this prolonged immune response. And so that's where my work dealing with patients with complex and severe autoimmune diseases is really helpful because over the years we've really learned what works well in that population to bring the immune system down to a more moderate level, right? To sort of tamper it down. We think about boosting our immune response, but there are plenty of situations where that boosted immune response is actually what's causing the damage and we want to actually figure out how to quiet down the immune system and that may be true in patients with long covid too for some people who have that mechanism yeah it's all about balance <laughs> it's one thing the Absolutely. longer you're in medicine you realize it's about balance for a lot of things you don't want too much you don't want too little you want it in just that that sweet spot so yeah, at least I think it does give us hope, especially for people that are suffering from these conditions. And I know for me, 
as a physician with COVID, you know, having experienced this COVID pandemic, that was one of my biggest fears is long COVID, knowing that I want to stay productive, I, I want to be able to concentrate and do my work and not have chronic fatigue and these kinds of things. So to me, the priority was like keeping myself healthy and strong so that I could avoid yeah. that happening because to me, that's like the worst nightmare, you know? So um, it does lend hope to a lot of people that want to try to recover and, and rehab after this. Let's talk a little bit about stress because we know that we live in a fast paced world. And of course the pandemic itself, being a pediatrician, I've seen so many stressed parents trying to do everything. And that in itself seems to be a risk factor. So what do we know about the role of stress on the gut microbiome? You're so right, Dr. Yami. It is a huge risk factor. And again, not just one that we see clinically as clinicians, but one that's been written about stress is a major risk factor for having a poor outcome and even dying in this pandemic. And we, we know that. And I'll just tell you a funny story. This morning, um, I like to try and get out in nature if I can in the mornings and get a little dirty, a little sweaty. And I'm lucky to live right next to Rock Creek Park here in Washington, DC. Sorry, I'm just looking for my water. Okay, let me take a little sip. So I was out rambling in the park, doing a sort of run, walk, calisthenics thing this morning. And there's a, there's a big hill I run up, and then at the top of the hill, there's a picnic bench. And I like to do some step ups on that bench. I'll do like 50 on one, like 50 the other, sometimes some push ups. So as I'm stepping up on the bench, there's a tree right next to it. And at the base of the tree, I see what looks like a boa constrictor. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and I am, I am not scared of any kind of insect, anything, but I'm scared of snakes. <laughs> and I'm not expecting a big, thick boa constrictor at the base of the tree on my morning ramble. So I immediately jump way up on the table, <laughs> this picnic table, and I could literally feel my heart rate. I have a slow heart rate. I'm a distance runner, not a fast one, but I go long distances. And I could feel my heart rate going from 40 to 140, literally. Like I feel my heart. I start to sweat. I can feel the hair on my body standing on end. I'm going, <sighs> I whip up my phone. I'm like, I've got to take a video of this. My family is not going to believe there's a boa constrictor at the base of this tree. And there looked like a piece where the snake was shedding its skin, like a mesh thing. And then I calmed down for a second. I mean, I'm getting excited, Dr. Yami, just talking about it. And then I take a breath and I realize it's a hat. <laughs> it's a hat. I'm going to send you the picture later. It is literally a camouflage hat. Somebody had a hat, like a floppy camouflage hat with some meshing. And they had left it at the base of the tree. And just the way it was curved around, it looked like a snake. Hey, veggie lovers. We are almost in the last quarter of the year. OMG, how did that happen? Have you been hitting your healthy eating goals? I know it's tough. Life gets busy and taking time to prepare nutritious meals can feel like such a drag. I've been there and I hear you. Listen, you can do this. If you need a reset, just start batch cooking one day a week. I know it sounds like it's going to be too hard or take too much work, but I promise once you get the hang of it, you're going to love it. Set aside just two hours to cook some beans, a whole grain, maybe some potatoes, prep your fruits and veggies, and you have to make a yummy sauce. Remember, the magic is in the sauce. I like to make a big jar of at least one, if not two sauces every week. It helps bring my meals together. It makes them delicious and I look forward to them. Some ideas are like a cashew cheesy sauce, a peanut sauce, an Alfredo sauce, creamy tomato sauce, all plant-based of course, but I also recommend always having backups because you never know what life is going to throw at you. That's why I love Bernie Wild's Adventure Sauce. It's so yummy and so versatile. It definitely has a bit of spice, but it's also mildly creamy, umami, and tangy. It's really a treat. You can use it as a dip, a topping, or you can douse your bean and grain bowls in it like I do. Make it part of your healthy eating arsenal. So it's called Bernie Wild's Adventure Sauce, and you have a good reason to grab yourself a bottle or two right now. My listeners get 20% off their first order of $20 or more 
and free shipping. Just use the code Dr. Yami. That's D-R-Y-A-M-I. Follow the link in the show notes or go to www.BernieWilds.com. After you taste it, I want to know what you think about this sauce. Do you love it as much as I do? Go get yourself a couple of bottles of Bernie Wilds Adventure Sauce right now and get your 20% off and free shipping by using the code Dr. Yami. Enjoy and hang in there. You can do this. So I took a breath and a moment, and then I realized it was a hat. (laughs) I came down off the bench, and I poked it, and it was indeed a hat, and I was good. But here's the thing. The amount of stress that that induced in my body, and that's an example of acute stress. And acute stress actually serves a purpose, right? As you know, it helps you. it, it, It triggers your fight or flight. So you can run away from the snake if it is indeed a boa constrictor that is about to, you know, wrap around you in the wilds of Washington, (laughs) D.C. So it serves a purpose to, you know, and it pulls resources away from your digestive tract, for example, and to the large muscles of your body. So you can literally run. Um, But here's the problem. We are having these boa constrictor moments throughout the day and night at all times. And so that acute, you know, that adrenaline and noradrenaline and, you know, cortisol and all those hormones that were all revved up for about 30 seconds for me today are revved up all the time. And I I think about just the physical toll. I mean, when I realized that it was a hat, not a snake, I mean, I could just feel my body relax, calm down, you know, all the tension. I felt my heart rate come down, my respiratory rate, all of that. And imagine being in that revved up state all day and not even realizing it, you know? So chronic stress isn't just in your mind, it's very much in your body and it's ruinous to your heart health, your digestive health, your mental health, all of these other things. And it dramatically increases your susceptibility to viruses. So we have all this great data, even well before COVID. We have an article from the proceedings, the Annals of Science that show That study took 276 healthy adults and exposed them to a common virus that causes a common cold. And those who reported chronic stress were five times more likely to become infected and stayed sick longer. So we see studies like that all the time. We have studies looking at college students getting sick during finals before exams when they're stressed and sleep deprived, which is a whole other one. Mm -hmm. So we know that chronic stress really affects your immune system and its ability to recover, not just from acute viruses, but also chronic. So, you know, who gets shingles? People who are stressed, right? That varicella virus comes back to life. Who gets mono? So we know that these chronic um, viruses that are often latent and our immune system is kind of handling them, when we're stressed and our immune system isn't functioning well anymore, they flare up. There's an incredible study from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, looking at men with HIV and showing that they men with chronic stress and they were looking at stressors like unemployment, you know, family turmoil, their HIV progressed twice as fast, which is just, I mean, it's just incredible when you think about it, right? To realize that these factors, some of which are controllable, can influence things to such a great degree. And of course, You can't always influence the things that are causing the stress, but you can usually do things to pretty dramatically change your response to them. This whole idea of the stress response and trying to trigger our parasympathetic nervous system that will calm us down instead of our sympathetic nervous system that has us so so stressed all the time. So these are the things that I think our typical sort of medical industrial complex doesn't pay attention to. I feel like we're a very pharmaceutically driven society But these are the things that pack a huge punch when we look at outcome, not just from acute infection, but chronic also. Yes. Oh, I love that story. It's hilarious. But yeah, that's a perfect example of your primitive brain trying to protect you (laughs) from, you know, being killed by this boa constrictor that was actually a hat. But but you're right. I mean, with chronic stress, it feels like that boa constrictor is wrapped around our chest all day long. Right. And so many people are living this and it becomes a vicious cycle, just like you said, because you have stress, but then the stress makes you more susceptible and getting sick is also stressful. Your children getting sick is stressful. So it becomes this vicious cycle. So what kind of things can we do to moderate our stress that are things that are achievable for the modern American? 
Yeah, I, I love this little book called The Relaxation Response. I may have it. It would take me a minute to find it. I have it in my library books back here. But this was a book written by Harvard cardiologist Herbert Benson back in the 1970s. And as you know, Dr. Yami, he was blacklisted from the medical community because he wrote a book saying that doing you know deep breathing, relaxation to bring down your heart rate and blood pressure could help treat heart disease. And, you know, here was a Harvard cardiologist describing practices that, of course, you know, have been used for thousands of years by different cultures and religions, et cetera. You know, he was describing aesthetics in India, et cetera. And the medical community sort of laughed him out of a job, I believe. And, you know, the book has been reprinted so many times. Again, it's called The Relaxation Response. And in my book, The Antiviral Gut, I do concentrate a lot on things like stress and sleep in the antiviral gut plan at the end of the book. And I give people some very specific things they can do, including just taking a breath, literally doing 10 deep breaths, you know, a three count inhalation, a five to six count exhalation. You want the exhalation to be longer, slower, really triggering your parasympathetic system. And that's because the breath is such, um, it's such an effective way to really trigger that parasympathetic system and get you to a state of calm. When I first left Georgetown and opened my practice in 2004, I actually had a biofeedback practitioner who worked with me, Emily Perlman. She was absolutely magical. And she would put the sensors on patients. So she would put one sensor on the finger that was typically heart rate, another one that was temperature. And uh, the third, she put a respiratory, a belly belt around for the respiratory weight, respiratory rate. And so it was heart rate, temperature, and I forget what the third one was, but I would watch these patients sometimes. I'd sit in and I would just see them warm. I'd see the temperature go up by four or five degrees as they vasodilated with the relaxation. Mm -hmm. And I would see the heart rate would come down, but more importantly, as you know, the heart rate variability would go up. So having a heart rate that's exactly, you know, 1.2 seconds apart like that is bad. You want there to be some variability. It's at one second, it's at 1.2, it's at 1.1. And so the increase in heart rate variability is an important sign of relaxation. And I remember she did a session with me and it was so interesting because the thing that I discovered is I wasn't breathing. I was, I was talking or doing something, holding my breath, and then I do a, you know, so long periods of time not taking a breath. And um, it's amazing how just breathing <laughs> really can relax you, right? Being oxygen deprived is pretty stressful. But the point is there's so many of these things that are completely subconscious. I did not realize that I was holding my breath for long periods of time and not not taking, you know, relaxing deep breaths on a regular basis. So I think biofeedback is a really exciting thing for people to explore. Now there are a million different apps, there's Headspace, et cetera, that um, can help people explore meditation practices. There are um, heart math apps that you can get to do that kind of training. So there's so many resources, but I also want to caution people to not get too tied up in the technology. Because the point of all of this is to relax us, which generally involves taking a break from the technology. So if you're dependent on your phone for the meditation, you know, the goal would be to wean yourself off of the device, even if you start there. So you start with a meditation app, but you get to the point where you can do this pretty instinctively. And, um, you know, there's just some fascinating data for how significant this stuff is. This isn't just woo woo, you know, this is real hard science with real hard clinical data behind it in terms of how important it is. Yes, definitely. And yeah, I agree. It has to be accessible. And I think that it, it can be for everybody just learning how to do box breathing or for kids, the five finger breathing, simple techniques like that, that you just practice over and over again. And for people that they're religious or spiritual, Prayer even is yeah. something that will bring that mindfulness and relaxation to your body. I discovered with prayer that I definitely can't do it at night because it relaxes me so much. 
I fall asleep. So it's like, you do my prayer in the morning. <laughs> and I've heard this from other people too. You, you like are wide awake and stressed out and you start praying and then like two seconds later you're asleep. So, <laughs> so you know, but that what definitely, a wonderful definitely technique. works. Yes, it definitely works. What a great works. technique to help you get sleep because that combination of being stressed and being sleep deprived, that is the worst combination in terms of your immune system oh, and, and susceptibility to viral infections and other pathogens. Yes. So yeah, I love how you included that in your book because I agree it's so, so important. All right, I wanna change gears just a little bit because I'm curious about a couple of things. We've definitely discovered, obviously, that there's some disadvantages to eating too many ultra-processed foods, as you've said. And then also for brain health, having too much refined sugar can be a risk factor for dementia and other brain things. So there has been a push for more non-nutritive sweeteners. We've had artificial sweeteners for a long time, for decades, but now there's things like monk fruit, stevia. Are those harmful to the gut microbiome? Should we also be avoiding those or are those going to be a little bit less harmful than what we've had in the past? I can give you a definitive, yes, they're harmful. Mm. And here's the thing you can't get something for nothing like it just doesn't work that way sweetness with no calories it doesn't so the problem i mean the more typical artificial sweeteners like aspartame etc we know that they can actually turn more benign bacteria into pathogenic bacteria and they're really problematic the the problem with stevia is that it seems to interfere with communication between bacteria and that itself leads to microbial imbalance so you know i really caution people and recommend just stick to regular sugar a little manuka honey something it's a few calories just have less of it it's not a ton of calories i mean if you're putting it in everything it is but these artificially sweetened drinks are just the worst yeah. and you know i remind people i had this discussion with my daughter because you know, she's grown up with me, so she's had me in her air, but she is 17. And I saw something in the fridge she had bought, and it was some drink with, you know, a bunch of stuff in there. And I said to her, I said, you know, this can't be right. This drink can't taste sweet like this and not have calories. So it's still causing a spike in your insulin levels. And I was like, worse than the spike in your insulin it's got a bunch of stuff in it that's interfering with your microbiome. And, you know, she gave me a little eye roll, but I think it, I think it did penetrate. And, you know, she'll say to me, look, mom, I just want to try something, right? I mean, I don't drink this stuff regularly. I just want to try it. So I do try and give her a little grace there, but really pointing out that it is, you know, if you were to drink a regular fruit juice, like that's not great either because that's spiking your insulin, but that's far preferable to some zero calorie thing with, you know, 10 chemicals and non-nutritive sweeteners that are going to mess up your microbiome and just have less of it. You know, fruit juice isn't poison. It's not a health food and it's not something that children should be drinking regularly. But if somebody wants a little treat and wants to have, you know, a little cup of apple juice or orange juice as a treat every now and again, that's so much better than drinking these chemical edible food like substances on a daily basis yeah yeah it's a tough one because they're pretty much everywhere and parents struggle because they're like well this has to be better because sugar is so bad and it seems like a lot of the drinks and especially some of these sparkling waters now have them added to it so you kind of you do you have to be careful reading labels and watching out for what you're buying so true. What about alcohol? You know, I feel like this one is so hard because yeah. you, you hear, especially like from blue zones and all of this stuff, and you even say people promoting drinking wine for longevity. So where, where does it fall with gut health? Alcohol is bactericidal, which means it kills bacteria. And think about when you go to get labs drawn, your blood work, they use a little alcohol swab on your skin to clean the skin and kill bacteria. And, you know, if you watch some of these old doctor shows that I love, like the Nick and some of these from over hundred years ago, before they had antibiotics, that's what they used. Mm -hmm. Alcohol was what they used to sterilize things. And so there's no debating that yes, alcohol does kill gut bacteria. The question, the debate is really how much, how much is okay? Because there are lots of things that we do that aren't necessarily that good for us, but they're enjoyable, we do them. 
And so really what I recommend for my patients is staying less than one drink per day. So six or fewer. Once you get into that more than one drink a day, and I'm talking more specifically with woman hair, although it really should be more body weight than just woman, but let's say for smaller human beings, which we tend to be, not always, um, and then we have other concerns like reproductive cancers. So we know from a lot of the data from Britain that more than one alcoholic beverage in women per day is linked to a much greater risk of reproductive cancers and breast cancers. And so again, we have to think about that personally. Like if you have a strong family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer, or you have other risk factors, you might need to make even more adjustments than versus if you have none of those. So I think the personal risk and the personal medical history is really important. They're general guidelines, but they're modifiable. And um, if you are somebody, a lot of the patients I see have severe dysbiosis. They've had you know, decades of antibiotics in some cases. They've been on steroids, they've been on biologics, they have autoimmune diseases. So you know, they have a different threshold and we're trying to do something really challenging, which is we're often trying to get them off a prescription biologic or immune suppressing drug and treat their disease with just food. That's challenging, that's not an easy thing to do. It's very doable and we have high success rates, but it takes a lot of work. And so in that situation where we have a big medical hurdle, you know, the alcohol is clearly not helpful there. And most of my patients are super motivated because they're not just trying to get healthy, they are trying to put a chronic debilitating autoimmune disease into remission. And what's really interesting, Dr. Yami, is I have the opposite problem. Like I'll put them on a fairly, you know, a fairly strict regimen in the first couple of months while we're really trying to see some progress. And then as things get better, I'll tell them, okay, you can liberalize. But they're like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I, I don't want to do, and I want to stay right here because I'm finally, you know, after 17 years, my Crohn's is in remission. I'm off steroids. I'm not trying to rock that boat. So Ironically, the problem I often have with my patients is trying to get them to liberalize because they, they're they a little bit scared, you know, because it's it's been such a long journey. Mm -hmm. So again, I think you have to really personalize this based on who you are, what your family history, your personal history looks like, and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, that, that was a great answer. Thank you so much for giving us that. What do you wish more people knew? I wish more people knew how harmful a lot of these drugs are to our microbiome, to our gut, to our bodies. And, you know, it's a complicated one for me, Dr. Yami, because I am a proud physician. I'm proud of the work the medical community does. I am thrilled that we have these incredibly efficacious drugs. I was at the first meeting in Amsterdam in 1998 when they were presenting data on the first, you know, commonly used biologic. Infliximab, marketed as Remicade, at the time it didn't even have a name, the drug was just CA2. And it was an incredibly exciting time, you know, all the, you know, the muckety mucks in gastroenterology in my field, inflammatory bowel disease were there. I was a fairly young doctor at the time, just a year out of fellowship. And people who had written all the textbooks, you know, really the leaders of the field were there. And we were all gathered at this place, Housterdoon in Amsterdam, looking at these results of what seemed nothing short of miraculous, how this drug worked. But then the problem is, as we started to see, okay, this drug can melt away inflammatory bowel disease, but it causes cancer and serious infection. I myself had patients who I took care of in the hospital who died from complications from biologics, from infection, from cancer. So you start to see the price, right? And what that really instilled in me is a, a really deep sense of judicious use and how important that is. So again, I'm thrilled that we have these amazing drugs at our disposal, but I'm alarmed at how they've become first line therapy, not just for complex autoimmune diseases, but for so many things for more, you know, and it's not for me to say if somebody's asthma or eczema is mild, you know, it could be very debilitating for them. But the idea that we use these drugs first line and we don't explore the incredibly powerful effects that changes in diet and lifestyle can have. And that is, you know, it's scary to me because again, I've been on the prescribing end where I've had patients who've been very sick, who've died. And, um, you know, at the same time, I've also had patients whose lives have been changed dramatically for the better because these drugs have put them into remission when nothing else could. So what we really need to do is we need to make sure that 
judicious use that there this is being used because nothing else has worked this is the last step and you really need this drug and i think there's just um you know there's a ubiquitousness and a sense like oh yeah just take this just try this you know and and not enough reverence for the fact that yes these drugs are powerfully effective but they also have side effects that can be incredibly problematic particularly in young people so i'd like to see more both on the on the medical side really too i'd like to see more you know one eyebrow raise well what else can we do and not so much um you know we're we're very very influenced by the pharmaceutical industry so i'd like to see more independent thinking and i think we are seeing that we're seeing more and more healthcare practitioners like yourself and others who have the training the expertise and are really taking the information out there to people we're seeing people like terry walls who with her walls warriors who she herself is somebody who has ms who's leading the way for other people with ms brooke goldner mm -hmm. with lupus who's leading the way so we're seeing healthcare practitioners who are literally like leading revolutions here and they're not saying like don't ever take the drugs but what they are saying is here's another way I don't have inflammatory bowel disease myself. I'm very grateful for that, but I'm also grateful for the literally thousands of patients I've taken care of, both with prescription drugs and with a more food as medicine approach and kind of, again, leading the way there. So I think that we do have communication channels now, thanks to programs like yours and people who are trusted healthcare practitioners who are you know, open to lots of different ways of doing it, but really, really driving home that message that you need to really work on the diet and lifestyle first as the foundation and then on top of that you add the medication yeah no i love that so much definitely resonates with me and you know you said judici judicious use which is so important but along with that full informed consent which includes your alternatives because very few patients are even told it's mainly like okay you have this very serious disease now you must take this medication they're never told you can optimize this you can optimize this let's work on your diet let's work on your sleep let's work on your stress that's never discussed and that is not giving full informed consent but the I doctors believe. don't know as you and i know many of our wonderful colleagues don't know they know the pharmaceutical side but they've never been exposed to the other yeah. side they weren't taught about it in medical school they don't have experience with it and that's why i think this stuff is so complimentary right it's not either or it's both yeah. and i will tell you you know my biggest referral base are other gastroenterologists yeah. that's great you know, that that's how most of my patients come to me is you know, a colleague who scopes them up, down, sideways is like, yeah, you have Crohn's. And then the patient says, well, what about diet? And they're like, um, yeah, go, go see, see Dr. Dr. Chuck. Dr. Chuck. <laughs> She'll tell you all about that. Like, they just don't know. Well, that's great, though, that they're open minded to it because they are. there are some that aren't. And you they know, they are. And I think it's so important to have, you know, conventionally trained people who also, you know, see see it both ways. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise we get into this we versus them. Yeah. So I was on the faculty at Georgetown for a decade. These are close friends and colleagues who I have the utmost respect for. I think they respect me. We don't necessarily approach things the same way, but I think they are happy to make that referral. And when somebody needs something more conventional, vice versa. So I think that, um, you know, that, that relationship can work. It's different expertise. Yeah. I mean, if somebody came to me and they had, a serious liver problem, I would say, look, I know about liver disease. I'm a gastroenterologist, but that's not my area of expertise. You need to go see my colleague who really treats people with hepatitis C. So it's really just acknowledging that I think different people have different expertise and um, helping people figure out where they can find it. Absolutely. But I think also in training, we need to be exposed and we need to learn some of these alternatives because like you said, we don't learn these things in medical school and residency. And so I think we need to go to that beginning place where we're learning this information so that doctors are aware. It's okay if that's not their thing and they don't want to specialize in knowing all about nutritional things to do, but as long as they know that it is an option and present it to their patients, I think that that's very important. And you know, we don't watch TV very much at our house, but my husband loves football. So during football season, it's on the weekends, and I'm just flabbergasted 
by like every single commercial is for autoimmune disease every Absolutely. single commercial and i cannot believe my eyes because i remember watching tv as a kid and barely you know you saw some drug ads here and there but now all the drug ads are for psoriasis and crohn's and it's amazing lupus. Right? it's like wow what yes. is going on here yeah. so it's very important i think for people to be aware that there might be other things you can do here as well so and i love the point you made about the medical education because this isn't fringe anymore right this is very well established science and so for example if you're a dermatologist and you're still treating acne by putting a teenager on you know six months of doxycycline I, I, I mean, that is bordering on malpractice. If you are not also informing them, finding out, do they have a history of autoimmune disease? So they may have a genetic predisposition and really informing them that, you know, this antibiotic may improve your acne, but here are all the other things it's going to do, including increasing your risk of these other conditions. So that has to be a part of the discussion. And I, unfortunately, I think often it's not yes. still. Yeah, for sure. Okay, you mentioned a little bit about your morning routine and getting out in nature, but tell me more. What else is in your morning routine? So I would sum it up as dirt, sweat, and vegetables. I love it. <laughs> I know that is, you know, hashtag dirt, sweat, veg. That is my medicine. Um, so I do try to get out in nature and <laughs> where there are no snakes and get a little dirty. So I'll often combine dirt, sweat. And we do have a very nice gym downstairs in my house, but I'll try and do stuff outside. So sometimes I'll even go in the driveway with some weights and some loud rap music, which <laughs> is probably, my neighbor will probably tell you, maybe it's too loud sometimes. So, you know, get the juices going. So I will try and combine the dirt sweat or, you know, do a workout and then just go walk on the trail. It's so beautiful, Rock Creek Park. There's so much nature. I try and not have any headphones or anything in. Today I had headphones in and then I took them out and there were all these incredible sounds. It was, you know, the river, the, the creek trickling through, the birds. It was amazing when I took them out. So I do try and do a little forest bathing, Shinrin Yoku as the Japanese say. And then in terms of veg, I'm very focused on trying to get that fiber in. I'll tell you, Dr. Yami, I'm not a great natural vegetable eater. Like my husband will have a salad for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I struggle a little more with the veggies. So I tend to do a green smoothie in the morning. And, you know, I, I tell my patients six servings of vegetables a day. So I institute this one, two, three rule, one veggie in the morning, two at lunch, three at dinner. And that way you get in six servings. But I'll usually flip mine. I'm usually three, two, one. So my green smoothie is usually the same most mornings. It's coconut water, and then it's two greens. So that's usually kale and collards, or collards and spinach, kale and, kale and spinach, two leafy greens, a stringy green, which is almost always celery, a green herb, which is usually parsley, and then fruit. And the fruit can be mango, kiwi, pineapple, a nectarine, whatever I have fresh. I have some fresh pineapple, so it was pineapple this morning. I'll do a squeeze of lime, a squeeze of lemon, sorry, and then some ice, and that's it. So it's a very green. It doesn't have any milk or creamy stuff. And I don't worry about the fruit. I put in as much fruit as I feel like. You know, if I feel like something sweeter, I'll put in three slices of pineapple. If I feel like I don't need a lot of sweet, maybe I won't put any in. Sometimes I'll put ginger in, but that's, that's it. And I drink that down. I try and drink a good like 30, 40 ounces. I mean, I fill up the Vitamix and I try and get it down, maybe not all in one sitting. And I'll tell you, I feel so good when I drink that thing. I literally can feel my cells just, you know, vibrating at a, at a good level. I really notice such a difference, not to mention that it keeps things very regular in the bathroom for me, <laughs> but I do feel like, you know, the, um, the phytochemicals from the flavonoids and the lignans and all the other stuff I'm getting from that food, I feel like it does great things for me and I'm, you know, I don't take any medication. I don't take any vitamins or supplements or anything. I drink my green smoothie. I try and get dirty and sweaty and that seems to work pretty well for me. I love it. Do you ever use cilantro for your herb or are you one of the soap cilantro people? No, no. I do like that a lot too. Although I'm, parsley is probably my favorite. Yeah. I love cilantro. Yeah. Cilantro is my favorite. I think someday yeah. I'm going to try to develop some sort of cilantro dessert. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Use it in every single way. 
I love this. I like cilantro in more cooking, mm-hmm. like in um, more savory. Yeah. But for my green smoothie, not as much. Yeah. But I do like it. I love it. Okay, great. Okay, so this has been fantastic. Let us know where we can connect with you and what products and services you offer. Sure. So you can find me at gutbliss.com or robinchuckcan.com. I've got sort of challenging first name and last name to spell, R-O-B-Y-N-N-E. C-H-U-T-K-A-N or just gutbliss, G-U-T-B-L-I-S-S.com. You can find me on Instagram at gutbliss. And um, I'm not currently seeing new patients in my practice, but that's going to change in January 2023. And we are launching a second version of what was our very popular course, Drug-Free IBD, Remission Without Immunosuppression. We launched it earlier this year and it was fantastic. It's four weeks and there's In addition to the workbooks and the recorded material people get, we do a live call every week. And I so looked forward to that call and hearing from people. And I think other people on the call too, you know, hearing how other people with IBD are struggling or what's worked for them. I mean, it's just a wonderful community. So I'm looking forward to launching that again at the beginning of 2023. And of course, the new book, I happen to have a copy of it here, The Antiviral Gut Tackling Pathogens from the inside out. I'm really proud of the book in addition to what I think is life-changing and life-saving information. The plan in the third part of the book gives people really practical, actionable steps they can do to improve their resilience and to improve their outcome if they do get infected. Ah, Beautiful, thank you so much for your work. Okay, last question before I let you go. Leave us with your best tip for parents. What is the first thing that they should do to help their children become more resilient to viruses. This is gold right here. (laughs) I would like parents to think twice before reaching for the medicine cabinet. And I say this, I learned from experience, you know, again, it's one of the things I have so much regret about. I did so much damage unknowingly, obviously, and unintentionally, but to my daughter's microbiome that had a lot of ripple effect to her health by going along with these, you know, antibiotics every month and not really understanding and thinking more carefully and not asking the most important question, which is, is this medication really necessary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, the studies show, there's a study from the journal of pediatrics that show that pediatricians prescribe antibiotics 63% of the time when they perceive a parent wants it and 7% when they don't. Wow. Which is an incredible gray zone, you know? So I want parents to have one eyebrow raised. And I'm not just talking about an antibiotic. I don't care what it is, a supplement, an over-the-counter, whatever it is that you are reaching for to put in or on your child, I want you to really think about it and think about whether, although it could be helping on one hand, is it hindering on the other, Mm -hmm. right? And particularly any sort of pharmaceutical product is to really do the research, think about it, have that dialogue, you know, ask in a nice way, but in a way that lets them know that you are not inclined to put your child on this drug unless it's absolutely necessary. Yes, super wise, very important. Dr. Robin Chutkan, thank you so much for your work, for everything you've done and all your other books and your courses and, you know, everything that you do to help people that are suffering from some of these conditions. And now for those of us that want to decrease our risk of getting and overcoming viruses. So thank you so much. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you for all your amazing work. I was so excited about connecting with you. So thank you for having me on. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.